Paisley Abbey has a special place in the history of one of Scotland's most popular sports, curling. Lynn McKenzie agreed to explain why, if I agreed to have a go. Hey, excellent. Well done. That was really good. Yeah. Let me ask you a bit about curling because I'm, I'm fascinated by it. It was first recorded, we think, at, at Paisley Abbey. Yes, we believe so. There's a record um, from 1541 um, where a couple of monks have been playing a competition against each other um, on the frozen locks, throwing stones down the lock. Um, we believe it's the first written record of curling. Why did it never go further than Scotland? It actually dates back to the Scottish parishes um, in England and Wales. They had a different culture and a different um, system um, in their sort of farming background and their sort of hierarchies, whereas in Scotland, um, most of the curling took place in their local parish um, through the churches and things. And what do you like about it? It's a very social sport. We're very inclusive. We can take on lots of disabilities and abilities in the sport and the age range. We go from 8 to 80 and we all play in the same game. We can play in the same league. Tell me, Lynn, about the other side of, of curling, which is all the sweeping that goes on. Yeah, once the players let go of the stone, the other team members sweep to try and influence um, the outcome of the stone. So let's have a go and look okay. at it. This discuss might it be way. a little easier, right? OK. OK, so we keep yep. sweeping to keep the stone clean, to yeah. make it go further and to That's keep right. it straighter. How am I doing? You're doing great. <laughs> keep going till we get in the house. Oh, what's the house? This target. Here you go. It's in. Is it? Yay! Yeah, just made it. Just. Cup of coffee at last, Lynn. This is lovely. Yeah. Tell me, when we were down there and, and, and talking about Paisley Abbey and the monks being these early players of, of, of curling, you got quite sort of animated, I, I, and I wonder whether you feel a sense of connection with these monks. Yeah, I think it's quite comforting to know that um, back in the days, the monks were out enjoying and being sociable and um, enjoying a sport and being part of a, com a local community. And for me, certainly with my faith, it's quite comforting to know that the sport that I play in has that background and those traditions. Um, and that sort of is comforting for me, knowing that my faith also stems from that as well. For me, my faith is quite personal. Um, it's quite a private thing, but yeah, I don't judge other people, but I certainly have a strong faith in that makes me secure and gives me hope and um, it gives me that comfort in times when I need something else there, it's there, I'll be rock behind me. <laughs>
I wanted to find out more about the pattern that made Paisley famous and the weavers who produced it. Dan Coughlin is curator of textiles at the Paisley Museum. That was it. Listen, come and sit down, let's talk. I'm better at talking. <laughs> but actually, even that is enough just to give me a sense of the, the, the yeah. skill, the coordination. Yes, and this is for a very plain That's right, piece yeah. of cloth. Yeah. But tell me this, how did it come to be called the Paisley pattern then? Well, originally it came from India, from Kashmir in India, and Kashmir was famous for hundreds of years pr for producing very fine shawls. And these came to Europe in the 18th century and became very fashionable among the aristocratic women of France and Britain and they were extremely expensive. They say you could buy a townhouse in London for the price of one shawl. <laughs> so uh, the European manufacturers then decided to try to imitate these, produce a cheaper version and these were known as the imitation Indian shawls. Paisley only started weaving them in 1805 but Paisley outlasted the other centres because they kept up with the technology. It was really the only British um, shawl weaving centre at one time, so it, the product became synonymous with the town and people just said, can I have a paisley rather than can I have an imitation in the end. And so the paisley quite, pattern was born? That's right, yes. But they, all, they were all God-fearing. Most of them went to church on Sundays and, uh, in fact, when they hired the draw boys, which were the young boys who helped them with the looms, the drawboy had to read a, a chapter of the New Testament every day in the workshop while the weavers listened to it. The, the poets and, and the poetry that came out of, of the weaving experience, tell me about that, because that was a very important part of the story. Yes, yeah, there were, there were a, lot of them, a lot of the weaving community regarded themselves as poets, uh, and there is... Um, a history of the Paisley Poets, which was written by a local historian, Brown, in the 19th century, and he, he names 200 po poets in it, and most of them were weavers. So m many of the weavers that, that have maybe um, a quill and a bottle of ink beside the loom so they could jot down uh, inspiration as it, as, it, as it came to them. They, they mostly wrote about local scenery, um, the changing of the seasons, sometimes the hardships of winter and the pleasures of spring and things like that. The most successful of Paisley's weaver poets was Robert Tannehill. Some of his work has been set to music. Let me win to her Soft the westland breezes blow Among the barks of Stanley Shore The maple sings for cheerio Sweet the crop flowers early bell Desklin' of ours to be dead Blooming like your body cell My aim my heartless dear Come my lassie Let us stray Our Glen Kellogg Sunny bay, And blithely spend The garden day Mid joys That's never weed Trees may bud And birds may sing Flowers may bloom and verdure spring, but joy to me they cannot bring unless we, my dear. Lab rocks fan the snow white cloud, silver socks we downy bars adorn the banks ebrio. Around the sylvan fairy 
feathery breakers fringe the rocks beneath the breath of bunny juice and dark thing is cheerio come my lassie let us stray our glen clock sunny and blithely spend the garden day mid joys that ne'er we do. To these may bark and birds may sing, flowers may bloom and verdure spring, but joy to me they cannot bring unless. 